Um, I'm on committees related to veterans as a Marine Corps veteran myself who served a part of my time during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It's really important for me. Um, you're going to hear a lot of similar identities to another member here, what I'm going to share with you. But um, I'm also an MSW, a uh, social worker by trade, leading a lot of policy on mental health. Um, LA, LA County needs a lot of support in dealing with a lot of the crisis we have related to mental health. I sit on the budget subcommittee as chair on health and human services, leading a lot of work on issues that are safety net related to our, our most vulnerable population. I'm just here to share about the work that we're doing and then learn more from, from all of you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Lee. I'm the State Assembly Member for the 24th Assembly District. That's in San Jose, Fremont area, so just a couple hours to the west. Uh, I have the distinction of being the first openly bisexual state legislator, and I was also the first... Thank you. The, the first Gen Z state legislator as well. Uh, I, ser I serve as the chair of the Human Services Committee, thank you, and I'm also the chair of the Legislative Progressive Caucus as well. Hi everybody, my name is uh, Senator Susan Eggman. Um, I, I, I copy my friend Caroline. I am also a veteran. Uh, I'm also... Uh, I'll, I'll get all our things out of the way. I'm a lesbian, I'm a veteran, I'm a Latina, and I'm a social worker. <laughs> We're kind of twins a couple generations apart. Um, so it's my honor to be here with you today. I am the current chair of the LGBTQ caucus and I'm really happy about that. And one of my ideas, because I, I represent um, Senate District 5, which takes in a little sliver of Sacramento County, all of San Juan, all of San Juan Key County, and, the, and a half of Stanislaw County. Uh, so, and I grew up in the Turlock area um, in Stanislaw County. And so I, I really, I know personally that there's, you don't have to be gay to be in a big city. There's, we're everywhere. And so when I took over as chair, I said, I really, it's important for me for the caucus to see the whole state and for the whole state to see us and know that you're not alone out there uh, and that we want to hear from you. We are all one community, so we're, we're here to take lessons from you. And I'll, I'll say I was first elected to the uh, Stockton City Council in 2006. And at that time, I was the first out person to run in the central part of, of uh, the state from, from Portland, Oregon down to Los Angeles. Um, and so, and I've heard from at least two people here today that I inspired them into politics. They heard me speak years and years ago, which tells me I'm old as hell. Um, <laughs> But that people are coming up behind us. So for everybody here, know you're inspiring somebody else. And that's how we do it, right? We keep building the bench and people following as we pull them up and then they pull up the next generation. So very happy to be with you here tonight. Well, good evening. It is great to be with you all. Thank you for being here. My name is Chris Ward. I'm the State Assembly Member in Central San Diego. Uh, it's the 78th Assembly District. Uh, if you uh, have ever been down to Hillcrest, a very vibrant community, uh, all the way up to Miramar and out to East, uh, East County, actually, is part of my district, too, in the city of El Cajon, uh, right there in the central part of the, that region. Um, I've been in my uh, second term right now. This is uh, finished up my third year in the Assembly. I'm also the chair of the Assembly's Housing Committee, a newly uh, appointed a new appointment there uh, as we've had some change in leadership. Um, a member of our California Legislative Jewish Caucus and previously also was on the San Diego City Council uh, really working on our, our local issues. Just really a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. I'm looking forward to some of our questions as well and I uh, have a distinct honor actually of being, uh, you know, not the, certainly the first from our region uh, but in a long line of succession of very powerful and amazing leaders. Uh, now our mayor of San Diego was my predecessor, our Senate President Pro Tem who has a big announcement tomorrow for the state of California, Tony Atkins, uh, and her predecessor, a trailblazer, Christine Kehoe. So we've got a lot of uh, history there that I wanted to share a little bit more with you about later tonight, but grateful to be here with you uh, here in the city of Fresno. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Corey Jackson. Um, I hail from the Inland Empire, city of Riverside, Moreno Valley, Paris, Hemet, San Jacinto. Um, and I am um, also a social worker. Uh, um, and I'm also the first openly gay um, African American elected to the uh, state legislature as well. Uh, 
um, and I chair the um, Assembly uh, Budget Subcommittee for Human Services um, and also chair the Select Committee for California's Mental Health Crisis. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so I'm going to pose this first question to Senator Aikman. Uh, Senator, can you tell us a little bit about the caucus? When, when was it formed and what does it do, please? Sure, the caucus was formed in 2002. Uh, and that was, was, and a caucus is comprised just of members who affiliate, like I'm in the Latino caucus, we're starting a veterans caucus, there's an API caucus, there's a Jewish caucus, so, African, so there's all these caucuses, and so the LGBT caucus started in 2002 when they had seven members, I believe, four members, so it was four members, that wasn't what you needed to start a caucus, uh, and it began then. <coughs> I will say this year, this last cycle, we made history when we became the first LGBT caucus in the nation to get 10% of a population. So that is impressive for California. So we went in, uh, in 2002 to, with four out people to now 12 out people. And I can tell you, we, you know, we help on campaigns and there's a lot of folks who continue to run um, and you know a lot of people here who are out and that's I mean it's just wonderful how the evolution has continued along so we focus on issues around policy around budget we focus on uh, areas like specific to us like a, a health and mental health but as the caucus we focus on inclusion issues around equity issues around uh, uh, like budget uh, um, issues and we have working with us uh, two staff members uh, and that will be if you have any questions and they, they help coordinate and put this all together tonight. Um, so we, we just believe, right, that, that coming together we're, we are strong, we are powerful, we have a pride every year, we honor folks from the community every year. What am I missing, folks? What else do we do? We do a lot, we're busy. It's the most fun caucus. We do so, we, this, another thing we started this year is scholarships, because we've always had a foundation. Thank you, yeah, thank you. We started a scholarship foundation this year, and we gave out, how many, did you give 10? We gave $70,000 uh, to, to LGBTQ people going on to study, and one of them, we did a chairs award that was for $20,000, and it's to a young Latina who is uh, out lesbian and who's working on her PhD and wants to work on it around LGBT issues. So that's another way that we continue to hopefully give back to the community. We work uh, closely with every pride organization, or, or if they have an issue, oftentimes they'll call our staff, our resources. We pull together um, statewide task force when we need to. Right now we're working on issues around all this forced outing. So we've really been focused on getting some good languaging and polling done before we we make our move to really work to protect our kids, right? That's, that, those are good words, protect our kids. We talk about it like that. Um, but those are the, some of the things that we do very, very uh, purposely, and we really let all the other members know that are not part of our caucus before they do some kind of bill that they think is gonna help our community, please come to us first. Um, because we have a lot of policy expertise in this, and a lot of times people think they're helping and they're not really, or they're stepping in the middle of something giant that we're, you know, that we're trying to work towards something. Uh, so there's a lot of strategy involved in how we move things forward, not just trying to make headlines, but actually make changes that people can feel in their lives. Okay, Assemblymember Ward, I'm gonna pose this next question to you, but, um... Why Fresno? Why are you guys here tonight in Fresno? Well, thank you, Council President. It's great to be here. And uh, if you had some, uh, I guess, attention last year, I want to again apologize. We were hoping to be with you last fall. Uh, and we had some scheduling issues that just really derailed us, but we wanted to make it our first stop here in this calendar year. Uh, but, uh, really through uh, Senator Eggman's vision, um, hailing from Stockton, but recognizing that we needed to do more to try to get out to areas where we're not often seen. Uh, it's great to be in our home districts, and it's great certainly to be able to serve the people of California, all 40 million of us, um, probably around 4 million of whom identify as members of our community, um, but we're spread out. It's a pretty big state, and it's geographically diverse, and we've got to make sure that we are doing part of our uh, our role as uh, a caucus to be able to make sure that we're getting out of West Hollywood, we're getting out of Hillcrest, out of San Francisco, and we're really meeting people where they are. 
Um, you've got great representation here. Uh, phenomenal allies who are 100% across the board and people like Assemblymember Arambula, Assemblymember Soria. And so we uh, lean on them as well to hear what's going on locally. But we need to know, and we'd like to, you to know as well too, to see us as a resource. So when we're trying to think about statewide programs or services, to make sure that you are equitably getting your fair share here because there's a lot of growth that needs to happen for your community members. A lot of the work that gets done starts in the community and even in San Diego, where we've come a long way, for many in this room, you know, it's been in our lifetime that it wasn't always that way. We've had great political representation, but it started with, uh, in the 70s, um, we, we have an LGBT center that just celebrated its 50th year. It's, it's wonderful, it's fabulous. <laughs> but it started with an answering machine in somebody's uh, closet. 50 years ago, and that's when they started to take those phone calls and help people secretly get the support and the help that they need, and growing community support translated into political support. The representation, uh, Council Member Perea will not be the last out council member, uh, but this is important. This is important base building, and so how can we be able to be able to support you and your community-based organizations with that seed support is what we're listening for. Um, I recognize this is a city. This is a, a vibrant city of a half a million people so I know we're doing a rural tour and we've got certainly a great urban atmosphere here too um, but we've been to Nevada City and Solvang and Riverside we plan to get out to San Benito County and up to the North Coast um, and when we hear about the issues around disparities for LGBTQ members in our communities around health care around access to education there are special needs for, uh, uh, for for Californians that we care very very strongly about um, so that's our take home we're here to listen for all of you tonight about some of the things that we should reflect in the work that we're doing through policy and budget making, especially in this difficult year. And I'm looking forward to hearing those answers later tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next question, I'm gonna start with Assemblymember Jackson and then whoever would like to answer. Um, the, the question is, can you tell us a little bit about some bills or budget proposals that you've worked on in the past years or will be working on that will directly impact the LGBTQ community here in Fresno? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was um, uh, able to author two bills that uh, the caucus uh, was supportive of and sponsored. Um, the first one um, actually uh, came from a situation that had happened right here in Fresno um, where uh, Rocio, um, who came to our caucus staff uh, to talk about the treatment that a transgender member of this community received from law enforcement. Um, and we're pleased to report that we were able to get this bill signed by the governor last year to ensure that law enforcement cannot dead name or misgender individuals they apprehend, as well as ensure that they cannot blast them on social media until they have actually been convicted of a crime. Um, so this came, this idea came right here from this community. And then we also made sure that uh, we uh, took the lead in making sure that uh, let people know uh, that you can try book banning in other states, but it ain't gonna happen here in California. So we make sure that people, uh, school districts, uh, cannot ban books based upon what we call a protected class, uh, which basically means based upon how God made us, you cannot ban a book because you don't like it telling the stories of LGBTQ members. You cannot tell, you can't ban books because you don't like hearing the history of how this country uh, treated African Americans and so on and so forth for so many um, other communities here in California. Uh, so these are the things that we are doing um, in the caucus. And there's two other bills that we're, uh, members uh, will talk about. Um, Senator Manjabar, want to talk about your bill? Absolutely. Thank you, Assembly Member. Um, in my first, yeah, thank you. I'm doing amazing work. Um, in my first year, you heard that I come from the social work background, and while this bill was focusing on any licensed professional under the Department of Consumer Affairs, it really stemmed from mental health um, professionals. Mental, mental health professionals that were being outed as 
um, gender non-conforming or transgender individuals who are being prevented from being at a job because their license had their dead name. So imagine you're a social worker um, and I go to apply. My name is Caroline, I'm a social worker. I present my license and my license says Roger. So that was continuously preventing a lot of our community members from being the very holistic type of therapists that we needed in our communities. So I'm really proud that we were able to work with a lot of our community members in getting SB 372, Respect for Names Act passed um, this last year. And I'll add on as well, we had a bill that was signed by Governor Newsom, AB 223, the Transgender Privacy Act. And that actually also has a Central Valley tie. A local advocate in San Diego, who I know well, uh, represents the Trans Family Network. It is a statewide organization, uh, and she's uh, very grassroots and it's growing. And last year she was up to advocate for a bill, but during that she said, there's something happening on the ground and I'm hearing about youth who get their name changed uh, or they're getting a gender change uh, on some of their uh, vital records, on their, on their birth certificates, on their, on their documents. And you know, to do that, you have to go down to the county and you have to actually petition to be able to have those changed and it is a public record. But of course, in this day and age, everything is becoming digitized, we're modernizing, so our counties are putting a lot of our records accessible online. And what she's hearing from uh, people in this experience is that a kid is going to a new school, say a middle school, and someone wants to know about Jane, and they look up Jane and realize that she was born John. And then they're uh, unintentionally outed, uh, not against their will, not on their own terms or on their own timeline. And of course, we know the downstream bullying and other harassment and effects that come from that. So we uh, required now that we are gonna seal those records until somebody is 18 to protect their privacy so they can choose the time and manner and place and to whom they come out. And we think that that's an important approach. And it started from community advocates and people listening about things that we can do to make policy better. We have a few other bills um, that I know uh, couldn't be here. I understand Senator Weiner uh, was one of your grand marshals of a parade recently, also a big champion. Um, but he's been working hard to be able to also provide foster youth some protections. Not everybody is placed in a loving and an affirming home, and we want to make sure as part of our process when we're evaluating those homes that recipient uh, foster parents uh, understand if they are accepting somebody that they should be accessing resources and that those are certainly available to them. Uh, we've got the Safe and Supportive Schools Act. Mr. Uh, uh, Assemblymember Zaber, who used to head Equality California, big champion for this, and sometimes we don't get it it doesn't happen on the first shot. This took a community three times, three different bill introductions, uh, but finally we're gonna have better standardization for a lot of our competency training for, our, um, for teachers and schools. And coming to everybody this fall, are you ready to repeal marriage equality, the, the, the Proposition 8? Yes, ACA 5 is gonna get a different proposition number, but I tell you what we're seeing, of course, after the um, horrible Dobbs decision and just the, uh, the, uh, the, the signs that we're seeing, from the U.S. Supreme Court, um, we're very worried uh, that Obergefell and other um, landmark cases could be overturned, and that means that, unfortunately, that hateful rhetoric is still in our state constitution. We got to take that out. We're going to take that out, and so we're going to need everyone to help us advocate to the ballot. I know you do a lot to register voters and get the word out, but that's coming to you thanks to Assemblymember Lowe. So, uh, you know, all these things, these bills that we talked about might sound very common sense to all of us in this room and very easy. Of course, we should respect people's proper names or pronouns, not dead name them. Of course, people should be able to be married to the ones they love. But you would be surprised, even in our California legislature today, how much pushback we get. Of course, you have your rabid Republicans and MAGA people uh, that are really, really opposed to it. Frankly, you know, I've given a lot of credit to our chair and vice chair. They do a lot of work behind the scenes also kill bills that would threaten our community too. Those are things that are still being introduced to this day. So they do a lot of that really hard work too. So, I mean, they're a grand filter in that sense. But these things sound easy to us, but still, sometimes to our frustration, there's a lot of resistance, not just from Republicans though, but sometimes Democrats who don't understand fully what we're trying to do and there's some resistance just culturally. And that's why it's so important that our voices as a caucus is in this space, constantly pushing back at these things. Because sometimes for us, we know these are existential threats, but for other people who want to be good allies, they don't, they don't see it. They don't see it, they don't act with urgency. So those, those things are really hard. Um, I want to touch upon 
some of the great successes we've had at the budget, though. In recent years, we've secured $81 million for the LGBT community, LGBT causes specifically. Um, so, and $81 million, just to, be, just to be very real, is a very small percentage of the entire state budget, which is a quarter of a trillion, $250 billion or so, is the entire state budget now. Um, so, but and as especially now as the budget situation gets a bit gloomy, we have to also make sure to protect a lot of our successes and our progress. But some of the things we've done are funding for the California Harm Reduction Initiative, so making it more accessible for folks to uh, do harm reduction services and overdose crises and health inequalities to get those services. We also have Hep C prevention testing and linkage to care, and we also um, are piloting a statewide community college LGBTQ pilots so that community colleges also can access safe spaces and resource for LGBT students. But those are just a fraction of the things we're able to do. And then, of course, on the local level, thanks to the efforts of your local assembly member, Joaquin Arambula, you secured $250 million. $250 million, that's more than all the LGBT money. But they secured $250 million for downtown Fresno development so that you can envision a future vibrant Fresno that will be connected to the rest of the state. And I just want to give a quick shout out to, like I love working with your assembly Marangula here, is that he has such vision for this region. And I have to just say is that, coming from San Jose, uh, we don't really have a neighborhood anymore. It's kind of split up and become a diaspora for many different reasons. Uh, but here, we still have a sense of community and thinking forward and making sure that community can grow is so important. So these are kind of investments we want to make sure that everyone can grow this, you know, here in Fresno and of course across the state, but that's the kind of work we do on the budget and the policy side. So thank you. Okay. All right, appreciate those um, remarks from each one of you. Um, the next question I'm going to give to Senator Menjibar. Um, Senator, does the caucus only do legislation and budget work? Absolutely not. I mean, I mean that takes up a lot of our time, right? I mean, the budget process starts in January and it goes all the way basically until June. It's a long process, but you heard from our chair kind of the other things that we do. You heard about our scholarship that started this year. You heard about the world tour that we started last year. We are working to activate these spaces, not just bringing resources, but letting y'all know that we're here to fight for you, whether you have an LGBTQ plus member representing you in the legislature or not, that we are 12 strong, uh, touring the state of California and let them know that this 12 strong group is holding, holding the line down uh, for all the LGBTQ plus individuals in California. We are joining different pride events. We, last year we went to Solving after they decided to no longer raise the flag in Solving. And we joined arms with our ally, our Senator Limon over there, to ensure that we had a presence there. Um, we're supporting all other pride events across the state of California. I think it's really important to ensure that what's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, does not happen here in California. Um, other things that we do is we sit down with the AG or Attorney General and talk about the lawsuits that are happening. We sit down with the governor as a Latino caucus, I'm, I'm sorry, that's another caucus I'm a part of, the LGBTQ caucus, to talk about our priorities and ensuring that we're holding the line there. You heard about polls that we, uh, we run to ensure that we have the right messaging. On the political side, we ensure that we don't stop at 12 members. On the political side, we're looking to elevate and empower people to be up here with us on the panel, uh, Council President. Um, we are looking to ensure that we grow that number because 10% should not be the ceiling for us, it should definitely be um, the floor. And we're really took, taking a big focus and ensuring that we're protecting, like the chair mentioned, our kids. Our, our TGI youth have really been, uh, been on the front lines of the attacks. Um, we're you know, focusing on our foster youth who make up a disproportionate, disproportionate amount of the homeless population. Looking what we can do there. You know, you heard that you have three social workers up here. You know, we ensure that when we talk about human services, that we're really looking to uplift the most vulnerable. So, you know, we support individual organizations. We highlight superstars every single June up in Sacramento. Um, we're excited about our next one this this June. If you have the opportunity, come just, um, join us in um, celebrating amazing career individuals across California. You know, but what's also important to know is that also this caucus sometimes 
um, has to spank some of our other colleagues. And I'm not talking about the good spankings. I think, yeah, that was pretty cool. But, uh, we have to understand the time that we're in. And that is, we know that rhetoric can put people in danger. And we started to see that with some of the members um, in the legislature. And we had to draw the line and say, that's not going to be acceptable here. And there's going to be consequences for targeting people, targeting communities, and putting communities in danger just because you want to satisfy uh, the dangerous basis that they're trying to associate with. And so also our responsibility that we take very seriously and members take notes when we start going into corners and whispering because they know that we have to let them know when they go too far. Um, and so we want to also lead by example to say when you are starting to target people, when you're starting to advance hateful rhetoric, when you're starting to disrespect other communities, that we're not going to allow that either, and we're going to let them know when they go too far. And just to add to that a little bit, um, as we've as we've seen this last couple of years, these cities, people are taking some very outrageous positions on on things that harm our community, and so some of the things Corey's are referring to, and, and uh, somebody referred to, or sometimes we do kill bills, like somebody wants to run a bill that is just, we know is going to bring people out of the woodwork to demonize our community. And we know that we'll have to have people there, oftentimes kids, to hear it. And it's not going to get passed. There's no good's going to come from that. And sometimes you have to shut those things down. Like, no, we're not going to allow our community to be used for you to make a political statement and get on Twitter and see if you can get on Fox. Unacceptable. And that's the power of being in a place... We're being in a place like California where you have 12 strong members and good members. You know, I mean, the, the, the pro tem or the Senate pro tem is not here, but the head of the whole Senate, Tony Atkins, who's an out lesbian, right? We're, we are known as a very powerful caucus. We, uh, I'll say, we also do lovely parties and people like that too. <laughs> Our Pride event is fantastic. Um, this just last year, we just, or last week, we had our welcome back session bash. We do a welcome back bash. It is incredibly well attended, so well attended, the Latino caucus said, let's partner. So then we had this whole <laughs> diversity, unity, back to session Love caucus, uh, but a lot of fun. And so really, if you have opportunity to come to the, um, our Pride event in June, um, it, it's a lot of fun. And we've, we've picked up people in the rural tour, so they're getting, they're getting more and more looking like California if you want to come and join us. Nice. And I'll add on as well, too, because there's the club. We are one of six of the diversity caucuses recognized uh, in the legislature. There is the Women's Caucus. There is the, what you are now, what are we at? 40%, right? We're aiming for 50%. We're at 40%. We're almost at parity. When I, when I got in a long time ago into, into the legislature, I started the assembly. I was one of 28, I think, women in a body of 120. And we, and now we are 50 strong. So not quite parity, but we're getting there. We have the Women's Caucus, we have the Latino Caucus, the API Caucus, the African American Caucus, the Jewish Caucus, and the LGBT Caucus. And we do get together as a caucus of caucuses, a diversity caucus. Um, to compare it, so when they see that somebody's coming at us with a book ban, or they see that they're trying to do something to hurt any one of us, there is a shield, and we circle those wagons, and we support each other. And so the intersection of all of our issues is reflected, and that is a super majority of the legislature right there. They can't break us, and so it's because of those, I think, collegial alignments that we have uh, that we have been able to grow more support for our LGBTQ issues, but in turn, we have become a lot more attuned to be able to support other communities as well. Yeah, and just to say, uh, Assembly Member Cervantes, who is not here with us tonight, is a member of this caucus and is also the chair of the Latino caucus. And, and the API caucus is you? Oh, it's Evan Lowe, who's also not here, but he's the chair of the API caucus. 
And Scott Wiener, who is not here, but is a member of our caucus, is also the chair of the Jewish caucus. So uh, we really do take over everything. Right. Uh, we think that's the important way to, to go. We, um, and we, we bring in our allies by, by taking over, and then we say, this is a new plan, everybody has a gay agenda. Uh, but, but seriously, right, I mean, we don't get anywhere without our allies, too. And so, I mean, just looking around, right, we are all people of multiple identities as we sit here in these seats. And so when you think about how you organize, how you raise a community up, you know you do it locked arms with a lot of other, all of our other mixed identities that we bring to the equation, use those to be able to propel the agenda forward. Great. All right, so Senator Aitman, I'm gonna shoot a question back over to you. Does the caucus have staff that supports it? And if so, can we give them a little bit of praise? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we have. So on the Senate side, there is one co uh, one staff member for, that staffs the caucus, and on the Assembly side, there's one staff member, uh, and they are uh, hardworking people. But on the Senate side, also a social worker, Jacob Fraker. Jacob, stand up and wave at everybody. Jacob, fantastic. And then and Natalia Garcia, stand up, please, Natalia. On the Assembly side. And so those are our two, we only have two staff members, but they do everything and are everywhere. And it's like, so you have issues, ideas, legislation, a task, whatever, you reach out to them and they, they are gay all day. Um, <laughs> and they're just waiting to answer the phone call from you. But yeah, they, we, we have staff and they are available. And, and, then, and then when you're chair, they become part of your staff. So I'll be sad when I lose Jacob, but. Yeah, we all know how important our staff is, so shout out to my staff back there too who is running around. Uh, but we have time for one more question um, to the caucus before we take it out to the audience. So um, assembly members and senators, uh, what, is something each, what is something each member would like the people of Fresno to know about the work you do in Sacramento? We'll start at the end. <laughs> I, I think the most important thing to know is is that uh, probably more than ever uh, since many generations before us is it important to really understand the importance of us truly being a part of a community. This is going to be a rough year. <clears throat> And what I see right now is a beautiful community. And it's gonna be your responsibility to making sure that you wrap your arms around each other. Now I'm gonna tell you this. I love my sister, but I can't stand her either. <laughs> but if something goes down, I'm gonna have my sister's back. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to do for each other. Uh, because it's going to take us all speaking with one voice to make it through this year and to push back against the wave of hate and discrimination that is on its way. Good to be here. One of uh, the hats I wear is uh, now taking on one of the biggest challenges we have across the state, and that's our growing housing crisis, and of course related um, those experiencing homelessness. Yes, we have a subset that is disproportionately affecting our LGBTQ community, but so many others as well. And when I think about the future and the opportunities that we have for Californians, uh, and the setbacks that we've endured over the decades of disinvestment, uh, it frightens me. And then we're faced with the realities that we have of all the budget or all the policy changes that we normally get into when we're thinking about how to be able to help California build more housing. But um, the budget situation that we have right now when we hear and more demands to do more. Um, and we see that, you know, a draft budget, which is far from the final budget, um, is proposing to cut things that are already underfunded and are already oversubscribed and really reflect, I think, what we're seeing from our district offices about the need for us to be able to do more because everybody's just at their wit's end. And so we have our work cut out for us. Uh, I try to, I recognize the magnitude of what, what's going on, but, uh, you know, I really stay grounded in my community conversations and in town halls back home just like this um, because 
we can, despite, yes, all those that show up and they want to have a theatrical scene um, and they're hateful, um, these real conversations remind us there's a lot more of us out there. Mm -hmm. And that gives me the, 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 uh, the drive to get up the next day uh, and get back to work and stay focused and get the job done. And I'll be there with you every step of the way. Thank you. When I just sit here and, and reflect for a minute, like, what do I fight for? Um, I, I think the simple word is dignity, right? I think I try to take into every situation. I said before, I'm a social worker, right? So I, we have a whole big code of ethics, but I try to break it down to, am I engaging, am I sustaining and maintaining relationships while I'm working in service to achieve a higher level of justice? Right? And, and that, for me, that, that's what keeps me centered and focused and moving forward. If I, am, if I am maintaining and sustaining the relationships around me, and if I'm doing that in the act of service, we get to a higher place of justice. So in addition to being a, a legislature, right, I'm also a mom of a 15-year-old, right? So Chris is a, a parent as well. And, and so, again, I, I'm fighting and looking for all kinds of ways to lift up our community, and also knowing that there's, there's a lot of kids out there, right, who are facing an incredible amount of stress right now, mental health issues that are coming down. Uh, I am also uh, a caregiver of my spouse who's got really significant and profound medical issues, right? So I think about transportation issues, I think about mobility issues, right? I think about all those things. I work a lot in the mental health space. There's a lot of work that I do. I vote yes on Prop 1, it's going to be on your March ballot. Uh, really reforming how we fund mental health services in California. And probably one of the pieces of legislation that I did in 2015 that I'll be uh, most proud of when I leave is the End of Life Option Act that give people at the end of their life the option to do their death their own way with the dignity that, that they desire. So, if I think about what, what drives me is that how do we break down barriers and open up pathways for everyone to be able to live their fullest life in a dignified kind of way. And so my last pitch to y'all is to think about running for office, yeah. right? Because we, we all have a time limit on our shelf life. And so you always need that next generation. So don't think about who else should do it. Why not you? Why not now? Why not get out there, right? We, and we all have skeletons in our closet. Make them dance. <laughs> So I definitely would echo that sentiment. If you are in a position to make change, whether it's running for office or making some change other ways, you should definitely do it. Um, I think something I would say is especially, you know, the, almost the metaphor of the, of the Tower Theater itself, where we went to a LGBT friendly gathering space to a not so friendly space for a little while, and then now a public gathering space, is that the, the cycle of society right now is on the upswing. It's for us to be in charge. You know, for many people in this room and many of my colleagues and predecessors, you fought really hard to make the world accept you. But now we are in the position to make the world acceptable to us. And that is really important in re remembering our place, that we have power to do it. A lot of people now, seeing the pro what progress we made in society, are scared. They think we are an existential threat, they're misinformed in that sense, but they will do everything they can in the crusade to eliminate us. Eliminate us. And Dr. Jackson talks a lot about this, even very publicly, how essential that is. But a lot of folks who try to be allies don't understand the changing demographic or the changing society that we live in with LGBTQ, society, LGBTQ people. Like, even people four years younger than me never have their outing, never have a coming out experience anymore. People starting just right under me, now they get to just be, be who they are and come and just come as they are, right? And that's a great progress we have, and now we also have companies out there that would love to sell you their products and sell you things they don't want because they have rainbows on them. They want to make money off of us instead. So, and I, I put this out a lot about rainbow capitalism, is because while these companies and people want to look, pretend to be our allies, we also have to hold them to the standard that they have to be there with us when times are tough. So when, this might hurt your ears, but when the beloved Dodgers wanted, you know, wanted to have 
some prolific drag performers come and then they're like, oh no, those people are upset, we're gonna pull them out. And then they, you know, they get the backlash the other way because that's not allyship behavior. We have to hold our allies to strong account and that's about making the world acceptable to us. So use your power and make the world acceptable for our community. Go Chai. But that's, you know, that's a perfect example of what else the caucus does, right? In that situation, when you heard what the Dodgers were doing, Two of our caucus members, including myself and uh, Assembly Member Rick Chavez Saber, we went into a meeting with the Dodgers and we represented the caucus in that meeting and basically said this was unacceptable and I'm really glad that they reversed uh, their uh, bad decision. And when I think about the work I do in Sacramento, I think about just the importance of accurate representation in positions of power, right? Ensuring that people that have these lived experiences are being placed and uplifted into these positions, right? Um, I think about my upbringing, you know, I do have a out, coming out story. I do have the story of, you know, being rejected in the Latino community. What can we do to ensure we remove all those barriers for little queer kids coming up? And what protection can we embed into our communities? Where can we go that we didn't have? Where can we create spaces that didn't exist for us when we were younger? Now as a, as a lesbian in my 30s, and I think about with my wife, when, if, if and when we want to start a family, I think about how much is that going to cost us? You know, I've been working on a bill um, for coverage of infertility to ensure that I don't have to pay $20,000 just to start a family. We are so strong as a state in um, protecting someone's ability to choose not to have a child, but reproductive justice is also to ensure we support those who want to have a child and when they want to have a child. So that's something that we're going to be working on a lot. And you heard about you know different members of this caucus being chairs of other caucus, but you also have chairs of policy committees here embedded in our caucus um, of health. Housing, both in the assembly and the senate, is led by gay men. Um, so the housing agenda is the gay agenda right now. You know, leading human services in the budget, and I think really taking a focus on our TGI uh, foster youth. Our TGI re-entry youth is a big thing that I'm going to be looking at um, up in Sacramento and just leading with that perspective of, I think about little Caroline and all the little kids out there ensuring that five, ten years, it's much more better. It's better than what we left it coming in. And my, sh my shelf life still has a long way to go. <laughs> So don't run against her. <laughs> All right, so at this time, we're going to uh, switch roles. They're going to be the listeners. Um, I know most everyone in the audience. I know none of you are shy. Um, so at this time, we're going to give folks two minutes each. Um, we have a microphone right up here. So if you would like to come to the front, um, we're going to give folks two minutes. No, I'm not getting up. I just want to make no uh, So this is for Senators um, Gbar and Senator Eggman. Um, you've been talking about uh, helping out the foster TGI youth. Um, just, it may not be a question, it may more of a statement. I'm an adoptive foster parent, and I'm worried about to open our house again to foster an adoptive child, um, TGI. Just wanted to make note, we've been finding difficulty with the transgender individuals having access to medical health care under the system. When in actuality, and correct me if I'm wrong, but those that are uh, female biological can go and get uh, the day after pill or even uh, put on um, the, <laughs> uh, those are the pills. Without parent consent, uh, and they can get them easily where our TGI youth are having difficulty in the system to even get any access, even if it's mental health to get the services started to get those hormones. So how, how can we re uh, solution that?
Um, and this is for all of you, but also to, uh, uh, to Chris Ward, Assembly uh, Member Ward. We've had an experience, and we know that our LGBT students uh, are facing homelessness and housing insecure more than any other population that there is. Uh, and then you couple that with you know, being a foster youth as well. I mean, we're seeing some of the highest un, uh, just unhoused rates among our kids. And I know all of you agree on that. So what can we do uh, to help advance your uh, efforts? Because we know in California, uh, we're facing a, a budget crisis, but how can we change the culture? Maybe, maybe uh, mirror something what Vienna figured out over 100 years ago that housing should be seen as a basic human right. So if you could maybe give us some comments on how we can change that culture. I think we all want to help. Hi, thank you for being here. We're so appreciative of you, uh, all of you, senators, assembly members. My name is Allison Murphy. I'm a strong ally as a mother. Um, I lost my transgender daughter to suicide in 2010. Uh, she was a Clovis Buchanan High graduate of 2009 and moved up to the Humboldt County area to avoid this rhetoric that this valley has been filled with. So I'm her voice. I'm here representing her. Um, every, every day that I get to speak her name is a joyful day for, for Chloe Ann Lacey. And thank you. Thank you. This is her picture. I just want to say I'm so grateful for you having the, I'm proud of you for being, just going out there and fighting for these kids. Mainly the, you know, the transgender kids is what I'm here for. Um, all, obviously the LGBT community is very important, but these trans kids are being targeted. Um, they need us, they need us fiercely to stand there with them. She was my only child, so I'm her voice completely for her with whatever we need to do to, to keep fighting this. You know, these kids need us. Thank you and proud of you for being so strong with your fight. And I'm also a stage four breast cancer survivor seven times. So I understand the end of the bill. I really appreciate that. So thank you for being here. My name is Stan Johnson. Um, I'm a community member. Um, okay, uh, I work a lot with uh, black, queer, trans people. Um, so I would like to know that you know that we're disproportionately impacted by homelessness, joblessness, everything. Um, what is the caucus doing to directly benefit my community? Because you know we have difficulties in the black community being accepted and this community. So what can we do to either inform them of us or make it a little, little bit easier? We're looking for some help, like some handouts or something, but what's up? <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here. I'm Jennifer Cruz, she her pronouns, and I have the honor and privilege of running the LGBT Center that you will be touring tomorrow. <laughs> For all your hard work uh, here in the Central Valley, and it's the only physical space you know we have here in the Central Valley. We continue to see in 2023 there were 10 different school districts that reached out to us about forced outing policies, bullying, and harassment of the LGBT youth. Uh, there is no accountability. Um, we see folks every day, no affirming health care, no affirming mental health care. No housing for anybody in Fresno. I was looking, the average rent for any room place in Fresno is between $15.50 and $16.50 a month. Uh, most people are making $16 an hour right now. We need help. We need help. <laughs> the Central Valley is referred to as the Bible Belt of California, and we have really felt that this year, and I am lucky enough to have figured out a way to get the funding to have the five paid staff that we have, but we see folks suffering every single day. Luckily, we have a supportive city council, 
Um, so we've seen a liaison put in place this year. We've seen triple the funding this year um, for that fiscal year 23-24. But across the board in this county, the school districts, if Clovis Unified, the second largest district, is, has this covert forced outing policy, so does everybody else. So do the other 33. I know Fresno Unified is doing a great job. Um, we hear very little out of complaints from students at Fresno Unified. But we need some accountability. We need some help. We need some affordable housing. We need affirming health care. And we're doing all we can as a staff of six. Um, I probably have some solutions. And I am running for office. <laughs> So my name is Alejandro Sanchez. I'm the chair of the only trans-Pacific organization in the Valley named Trans Emotion. Um, <laughs> so uh, what we see a lot is people experiencing homelessness and housing instability. And again, like echoing everyone, we need help with people who can't pay their rent, people who are homelessness. But I experienced homelessness as a trans man who was in my early transition as a youth. Um, at 18 to 24, and so I experienced a lot of discrimination in shelters, even in youth shelters that were supposed to be helping me, um, were not safe for me. So I'm wondering what you guys are doing <laughs> for the LGBT youth who are experiencing homelessness, what can we do to open shelters, specifically from between San Francisco and like Los Angeles? They tend to take up a lot of the money. I know they're bigger than us, but places like I'm from Mendota, like Miguel Arias is. Woo, <laughs> and so like it really is, like the only reason I could transition, sadly, was because I was homeless in Fresno. And so we really do need housing for youth, for everyone, but specifically for youth, because it's not safe in the foster system, it's not safe at home. Families are getting away with kicking their kids out because they're trans, like it's not fair. departments, things like that, and um, in fact for several years was with the only transgender department, transgender health department that was um, recognized by IEHP. I'm, I'm actually originally from San Bernardino, I just moved here, which also kind of gives me a lot of like different aspects, let me tell you. Um, and I moved to Visalia, not Fresno, so, but Fresno's great, this is where everything's happening. Um, but anyways, so along with all the healthcare uh, comments that folks are making, I want to say that um, I now work for a national company that provides service like LGBTQ health concierge services. And what I'm finding, I have had people who are located in this area. I am now located in this area. And what we do is we find um, affirming healthcare for folks that's safe for them to go to. And let me tell you, when it comes to rural living, um, it's almost impossible. You have to go over an hour anywhere to find um, fitting, affirming uh, providers. And I know that there are laws where like, if you don't have someone who you can access those services from within a certain radius, then you should be able to have all kinds of other things. Now, I don't know why there was rumors, sorry, I'm not taking time. There was rumors some years ago that the state was going to pass that every single health facility that is funded by the state had to have someone trained in LGBT services because that would change significantly the game of finding affirming care for folks in all areas. 
I worked all the way down from Julian, down by San Diego, um, El Cajon area, and now I'm working in a national company, and I see it. California's no different than me trying to find health care for folks in my like, Texas at this point. That says a lot. Um, and then two seconds real quick. Also, when it comes to that and the laws behind, I mean, you're making folks having to get diagnosed with gender dysphoria in order to receive services, and they have to prove it in several different ways to get what they need. I know that's insurances, but why isn't also that a requirement, or why isn't that PHI for the kids in school who are being forced out it? Because if you're making it, if folks are forcing it to be a diagnosis, then I don't see how that is not connected to PHI if they're experiencing this gender dysphoria from the DSM-5. Thank you. I know, no, not Misty. I'm gonna keep it short too. I don't really like speaking either. Um, I'm a transgender, lesbian, combat veteran with the Army. I deal with a lot of veterans and active service members. Um, there's been a lot of, a lot of pushback, a lot of red tape with the VA as far as mental health and gender affirming surgeries. I had to go outside the VA for my own surgery um, about a year ago. So I'm just trying to find out if there's any direction that y'all might be able to push me in to help them. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Kyle Robert Schmidt, I'm the Executive Director of the South Tower Community Land Trust. Um, uh, this is the neighborhood where I grew up, and this is the neighborhood where I serve. Um, it was in 1991 that I lost my father to AIDS, um, and it, that was the same year we had our first Pride Parade on Olive, so those kids are tight. And we show that like, our community stands up and cares for each other, and I, I received community support as a kid uh, that I want to continue to give back. Uh, in founding the South Tower CLT, we're investing a lot in housing and parks in the neighborhood. Um, the kind of input for state level is that a lot of housing funding directs to the larger metropolitan cities with the requirements, um, and there are specific set-asides for rural, but like mid-sized cities like Fresno really get left behind, especially in neighborhoods that don't have grocery stores, don't have, um, you know, access to um, healthcare and things like that that become factors in how housing is scored. So we're really looking at um, how we can structure it so more funding comes to cities like Fresno that have been disinvested for so long and have a greater need, as well as um, looking at innovative and small new organizations um, and not requiring as much experience in other developments in order to receive funding. So really focus on um, highlighting some innovation. Hello, my name is Robert Turner. I live in the, the council member of Arias' district here in Fresno. Uh, I want to bring up the, uh, on the other side of Fresno County, on the west side, there's a mental hospital that's uh, at Colinga, and it houses sex offenders who have completed their prison terms and are now being held because they might commit a crime in the future. They're, they this has been determined not by psychics like in the movie Minority Report, seeing their future crimes, by psychologists who have determined that they are likely, more likely than not, to reoffend. So if they, they use their protocol, their statistical protocol with certain factors to determine whether or not they um, meet the 51% uh, criteria of likelihood, which is not a scientific criterion in hard sciences, it's uh, more like 67%, but they use a 51% to determine that they're likely to commit a future crime and then they send them to the hospital for a treatment there. Now, my impression of the number of people there, and, and yes, I was there. I was there for six years. Before that, I was six years in a task of air state hospital. I spent more time in the forensic hospitals, the, the mental hospitals, than I did in prison itself. Now, one of the factors that they use to determine this, whether they're likely to offend, is whether they've been married or not. If, they're, if they've been married, then they're less likely to be offended. And most of the people there were there before gay, gay men could get married. My impression is that half of the people in Colinga State Hospital are gay. And this is disproportionate, there's something wrong with that. 
And there's many more things wrong with the whole protocol and how they decide this, and the very fact that they're being held there for future crimes and not for the crimes that they did commit. And I, uh, I, I, I had a proposal for turning the hospital into an adjunct facility of the prison system where they treat prisoners who are sex offenders for four years prior to their parole. And then they let them out with, you know, uh, lesser <coughs> restrictions than if they hadn't had the treatment. And with this, if they did this, there would be 100% of people there at the hospital in treatment, which is over 1,000 people, maybe 1,500 people. Whereas right now, most of the people are, a lot of, a lot of the people are refusing treatment. And there's all sorts of lawsuits going on. So it's expensive, it's, it doesn't work very well, and uh, it needs to be changed. The whole Section of Honor Predator Act needs to be revised, amended, and uh, turned into something else. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Sai Vianney. I'm a school psychologist and an educator in public senior high school district. And I just wanted to speak on behalf of the students that we serve in Clovis Unified, um, particularly our LGBTQ plus students who are watching pride flags in their teachers' classrooms be taken down or asked to be moved, who are navigating a covert um, parent notification policy for them to access facilities, locker rooms, and safe spaces that they very well should have access to per AB 1266. And so what I need from you and what I need from our community is your help in providing clarity in the law and the safeguards for our students, but also those protective factors for our students to know that their allies are safe, that their teachers can be safe allies and visible for them because that's what we need right now in Clovis. So, yes. thank you. Hello, hi, my name is Jennifer Webb. I am the Administrative Manager for the Fresno Madera Area Agency on Aging. So I'm gonna keep this really short. I would like to know what the caucus plans to do to help our older adults and the LGBTQ community. Hi, my name is Eric Johnston. I'm a father of a 14-year-old son. I'm legally blind. I'm hard of hearing. I'm HIV positive. Um, West Care of California has elected to move the only HIV center that was here in the Tower District right down the street to the airport. We had a petition asking them not to. We had a meeting and our answer at the very end of the meeting, the decision was made. Excuse me. The living room was founded 27 years ago to be a client-based organization. And when they made that decision, they took client base and knocked us to the side. We are asking for to get a center back. And I'm hoping to communicate perhaps with all of you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Diana Feliz Oliva. I'm Latina. I'm trans. I'm also an MSW. I'm not a veteran, but I gave it to many, many veterans in my time. <laughs> I'm originally from Sanger, which is about 15 minutes east of here. And I talked last time in town. But growing up in this rural farm working valley, it was really tough for shy, feminine, awkward little kids like me in the 70s and the 80s. And so when I was old enough, I knew that I needed to leave for my safety. In 2000, January, so 24 years ago this month, I was diagnosed with HIV at the Fresno County Department of Public Health. And I was outed shortly thereafter. And so I made a drastic move of leaving my hometown to LA where I can be open and proud, living as trans and living with HIV. And then I moved to New York, I moved to the Bay Area, I live in Mexico City, and I live in Fresno. And I just founded and created the first um, Latinx LGBT Center. And my main priority are the transgender immigrants. California hosts 25, a little over 25% of transgender immigrants. Most of them are aging because we didn't expect to live past 35. I'll be turning 52 this year, which is a huge milestone. 
for Brown, Trent, and Peter. And so I just want to make sure that hopefully that we get your commitment to support transgender services, not only in mental health, which is crucial as NSWs, you all know, but also in housing situations, in academic institutions, and more importantly, in economic development workforce opportunities. And I would love to sit on a statewide commission with President looking for bodies from Fresno. I'm sure there's plenty of people here that are looking to share their voices and represent Central Valley because we need to start allocating more funding to, the, to Fresno and the Central Valley rather than to Los Angeles and the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the, to the Central Valley. My name is Brock Neely. I'm the chair of the Clary County Stonewall Democrats. I'm also one of the founding members. Uh, just to celebrate some of our victories in Porterville, in 2008, the city of Porterville was the only city of, in the state to pass a resolution in support of Prop 8. That's when I first started going to city council meetings. I've missed 17 since then. I've been to more of them than the most of the city staff. <laughs> I'm their institutional memory. <laughs> but since then, in 2013, we had a Pride Month proclamation that was rescinded. First proclamation in the history of this country to be rescinded. So we worked on the procedure for getting proclamations, and now I can get a proclamation whenever I want. Um, I've built allyships with some of our city council members, with city staff. I actually wrote a staff report for an agenda item a couple of months ago. They never have a citizen write staff reports for city council staff. So that's just some of our victories. Um, last year we actually had our first official Pride event. It was a uh, kind of an information fair. Jason helped put it on. Uh, thank you to Jason. He's been a big driving force here in this part of the valley on getting resources out and support and going to Clovis school district meetings and fighting them. But uh, there's a lot of work to do, but we do have some victories. Um, the mayor we had that did issue the proclamation in 2013, and Susan knows, she was one of the uh, recipients of the 2015 Pride Awards. And Actually, the first uh, straight ally to get one. Thank you. Uh, we have about five to ten more minutes left, so if we can just keep comments concise, that would be appreciated. We're going to try to get for as many people as possible in this line. Thank you. I will be as concise as possible. Perfect. My name is Drew Harbo. I use he and him pronouns. I am the current chapter president of E-Flag. <laughs> Uh, I'm an outreach center man. We do a lot in the community to be one of the things that I'm most proud that we do um, is we actually do the statewide required trainings for LGBTQ <coughs> competency for Casa Fresno Madeira. Casa is the court appointed special advocates. They are volunteers that work with foster youth, and this is this is something that is dear to my heart. Um, I'm using this. First of all, they need people. They want people who look like us to be advocates for their youth. So I'm going to use that as a ploy to get folks to come in and find out more about that. Um, but while they are doing that, they want people to represent the youth that they are working with. And one thing that they have trouble with is that the people that they want to represent, the people that they are working, the youth they're working with, are too busy trying to find jobs, trying to find houses, trying to keep their heads above the water. So I wanted to use that as an example briefly to echo what so many of my colleagues have said here tonight, which is the Central Valley needs help. We need more jobs, we need more housing, we need more affordable solutions in order to lift up our community as a whole, especially those who have multiply marginalized identities. And I thank you for coming out tonight and listening to us and hearing us about that. Thank you. Uh, at least no one recognizes me by name. <laughs> but as the uh, Madam mentioned, I am Kevin Romero. I am from the city of Mendota, small, from the forgotten part of Fresno County. You know, no one knows where, who we are or where we are. That's fine. I'm used to it. But I, I've heard of this, and I wanted to come here and, and honestly just you know say thank you because it's people like yourselves and of course Annalisa as well that has 
inspired me to run for higher office, which I've been doing since 2016. I haven't gotten any yet, but I'm still working on it. You know, um, um, but I did get into one local position within the city. I'm um, actually, when I got appointed chair for Parks and Rec, I was one of the youngest appointed in the city. Anyway, so Perfect. I'm, I'm still working in progress. But I, I uh, but uh, yeah, just thank you and keep inspiring younger people like me to run for higher office. Perfect. Three words, universal basic income. Mi nombre es Ángel González y soy profesor aquí en la Universidad Estatal de Fresno, Fresno State University. Lo que les ofrezco es que tenemos que pensar de esos obstáculos a través de que no solo solamente somos una comunidad LGBT, pero que existimos incluyentemente a través de diferentes raíces, culturas y identidades, ¿verdad? Porque como todo esto, ¿qué pasa para las comunidades que no hablan inglés? ¿verdad? ¿Cómo están agarrando los recursos y los apoyos que los están impactando a ellos a niveles más impactantes que a otros, que a la comunidad, que no están a, en la intersección de diferentes a, estructuras y obstáculos que los ofrecen a ellos y a ellos? Muchas gracias, es lo que les voy a pensar. virtually so that people who are disabled or who may not be able to attend in person can attend. Um, and so the message that you're hearing is a very specific one, right? Um, we've heard mostly from you and considering you the limited audience of this forum, there's been a brief opportunity for community members to share that um, I'm doubtful and discouraged that much meaning or power can be derived from this event other than representation. Um, I'm here because I want what all of us want, which is health, safety, right, and thrivance for my community. That may be where ideas and beliefs diverge. Um, I'm also a master of social work, and as social workers, I hope we can understand the importance of respecting the intersections of oppression facing our community. Is it possible to thrive when the air is not breathable, the water is not potable, and our land is actively being destroyed by monoculture and water and other resource hoarding? Our community is constantly under attack from the and political extraction from electeds and funders. Uh, for example, you hear two hundred fifty million dollars for revitalization. I hear continued gentrification from outside investors and political opportunities for developers to build their wealth. The expensive people who live here and cannot afford to live. Uh, you say queer advocacy for inmates. I hear gender literate prisons. Um, queerness is a political identity. We've done all of the right against police brutality. Uh, gender Cruz mentioned that the Central Valley is referred to as the Bible Belt of California, which it absolutely is, and it is also referred to as Prison Alley because of the high concentration of facilities here. The renowned prison and prison establishment with Ruth Wilson Gilmore wrote a book that centers the complex web of extraction and uh, profit that have to do with that system, having to do right here in the Central Valley. I encourage you to read it if you haven't. While I understand that you are proud of your military service, I hope that you can also under understand how deeply offensive it is, it is to me as a, someone who lives in a community where so many people live below the poverty line, that the armed forces are literally recruiting children to participate in global genocide with promises of education and travel. behind closed doors meeting with Fresno Unified in order to erase Palestine from ethnic studies curriculum at the local level all around the state. I think it's very interesting that he's not been here tonight. Um, over and over again, what I hear is that queer people, from queer people is that we want to live, we need access to housing and relevant health care, we need rent control, we need investment in our community, we need poverty alleviation, we need to decenter extraction, performativity, representation, and criminalization. What I would love to see is investment in pathways out of poverty that center and honor the dignity and spirit of queer people rather than the continued criminalization and exploitation of queer people who are doing our day to survive. to follow up on that. <laughs> my name is Sin, I go by any pronouns, and I'm a prime example of the youth here in Fresno and the Central Valley in general. I've dealt with anything and everything the past year. Homelessness, freaking abusive family, just trauma, trying to figure out my own mental health, and just trying to find community in here. And I feel like that's a huge part, sorry, 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, just trying to find education, because I didn't know about all the many resources here in Fresno, California, or even in the Central Valley, like, were available for me, someone my age, 23. So I can only imagine the kind of stuff that people younger than me are going through, and they don't even have the resources available. So just please, please educate people around my age, my youth, because they, I cannot bear what I had to go through, and I can't even say it right now, but just please protect the youth because they're the next generation and we need to guarantee them. Hi, my name is Lizette Rojas. I work for Oasis Legal Services, the only legal nonprofit in the Central Valley that helps LGBTQI <laughs> They have to choose between being Latino or being queer because the president cannot be both and they've been struggling so hard. They have been unable to get mental health access. Um, I can list off everything else, but they need help and we need help to continue to help that battle because a lot of them are removed for seniors that we can't help with and they need help. And the four years of crisis, this year's an election year, we're hoping for the best, but we are preparing for what, what is to come. So we just, what can you do to help us? Hi everyone, my name is Ambassador Main and I also work with Oasis Legal Services. I go by data and pronouns, I'm a proud queer, mom, non-binary, Fresno uh, native here. And so I just had a couple questions that I had written down earlier. So a couple things that I'd like to know more about is, what is the caucus doing to support California queer immigrants and asylum seekers? And how is the caucus ensuring that money secured for the LGBTQ plus communities are being equitably distributed to Fresno and other rural communities in, in California. I know that uh, Assembly Member Alex Lee you mentioned 81 million. I, I would just like to uh, see more of the money here in Fresno and the Central Valley uh, to support our communities here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lucrezia Fabla. I uh, left Texas and moved here last year. Um, off of a lot of luck and privilege, basically. I got a disbursement from a lawsuit that allowed me to actually just start over and pack everything I could into my little Buick but of my life that would fit into it. Um, and what I came up here to say is that the meaning of the word sanctuary state has felt like it just means once you get here. But there are so many people in red states, like where I'm from, that can't. Um, that don't have the privilege that even I have. I'm not by any means doing very well, but I was extremely lucky. Um, and like a lot of people have said, this is an election year. And so I think the meaning of the words sanctuary state um, needs to expand to actually help people that need to get here from red states and dangerous places like Texas and Florida do that. Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Yes. I'm Sam. I'm a trans man, a black African trans man, and I was wondering what would you do for the black trans community that is getting hate crimes on and off, like everywhere? I myself am a survivor of suicide, uh, a lot of trauma, currently getting help for it. Um, but again, just because I have access doesn't mean that everyone else does. So please make sure you're funding, um, like for example, my partner is going to school to become a therapist and they're trans. So we need to, we need to be funding therapists that are trans, who know trans people, their people are trans people, specifically by trans people. Another thing is, um, we need to do something to, to lower the murder rates and hate crimes against trans people. Um, it's especially for cutie pop and um, BIPOC and all those um, people. And I think that, you know, it's one thing if you say the cops support us, but the thing is, is over and over cops don't really support us and I don't really think policing is the solution. Um, so maybe consider more community funding towards like psychological services and support police budgets. I appreciate that, thank you. Come up here and share your thoughts. 
Um, at this time, we're going to have closing remarks from Chair Aikman and Vice Chair Ward. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who came tonight and for all of your participation and everybody who got up to say something. Um, Jacob and Natalia were taking notes on everything while we can answer everything um, tonight. I mean, the issues around trans kids, it is, it is, we are, we are zeroing in on that. Um, we have tried to write a lot of funding and guidance and on the school issue, we're, we, 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 we have formed a statewide advisory council. If anybody's interested in that, you can talk with Jacob and Natalia after uh, to really be able to do just what we're talking, if you're talking about, like making sure we're not just talking to cities, but we're talking to smaller communities and getting all of that input as we frame what that actual policy piece, because again, we are state policymakers, right? So we do the policies at the state level and one, a lot of the things that folks were talking about were things that we work on around housing and funding for those. And I'll say, well, Fresno feels like you feel like you guys get left out. From Stockton, we feel like y'all get everything, right? I mean, so it's all it's all relative to where you sit. And I and I just I don't know that I can stress enough. Representation matters, right? You have good members in in uh, in Sacramento. I looked real quick at your board of supervisors. Who are the ones who pull down your mental health money, who pull down your foster care money, who pull down your housing money? I don't know what their party are, but they're all white men. Well, I, but I'm saying, those are your elected leaders at the county level. I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just saying, run for office, right? You gotta run for office. You gotta get them out. You gotta get them out of the way so we can actually serve the community in the ways that need to be done. Um, so, so just to, to say that, right, I mean, a lot of the, the issues that you're talking about, we are, we are doing our very best to focus on. Again, we, we do statewide policies. A lot of that money, those services, all need to be delivered at the local level. Um, so you got a council member here, you've got assembly member here uh, to be able to work on the, the individual right, issues that you're talking about. Um, but everything else that you talked about, we are taking notes and are the things that we continue to work on. And please check back with us. Don't just think that today was a one and done. Check back with us, stay engaged with us, and continue to be able to partner with us in ways that really make a difference, right? Um, if people feel like coming here tonight was just like a, a one and done, I mean, you know, that's not it. We are here, we, are, we feel like we are representative of, from all over the state as parts of community just like yours. Uh, and if you have a community meeting in everybody's community, you're gonna hear many of the same issues, right? Because these are the issues facing California around healthcare, around housing, around immigration. Of course, ours are more special because it's around trans issues a lot of times or LGBT where our family supports aren't the same potentially as others and from other communities. And of course, the, the local that the vitriol that is taking place around this country right now puts puts a fear in people like I think but I think we need to, to kind of those of us who have been around longer or the, that, that that time goes so fast and so slow at the same time right like like I was not in uh, I graduated from high school in 1979 so I'm lesbian right but I certainly wasn't out uh, and I would say now, if people are, are graduating, they're able to get out. There's clubs. So while that's right, things happen really. Go, if time goes fast, it also goes slow. And so, and that, all, all that to say is that maintain your hope, right? As oftentimes it's, it's easy to get immersed in the things that are wrong, but let's also give give power and give strength and that voice to the things that we do so right, right? Because everybody in this room is a survivor. And everybody in this room is beautiful and thrives and has so much to offer to each other and to the community as a whole. And we do that, as Corey talked earlier, about having each other's backs and staying together and continue to be in spaces where people are going to be going to be angry. It's just going to happen, right? But you have to be able there and experience the words, experience the pain, and then find ways that we come together to make things better. So um, it has been our honor to be here. Uh, oh, the survey. Who asked about the old lesbians, the old gays? Um, the Department of Aging, uh, there you are, the Department of Aging, somebody else asked about the old folks too. The Department of Aging, for the first time ever, I am an old folk. The old folks, we are seniors, I'm leaning into my wisdom. 
The Department of Aging is uh, doing its first wide survey on LGBTQ issues. So for the first time ever, we're doing a statewide survey on the experience of older adults and what they need. So please go to that website. When we get the actual live link, we'll make sure we send it out to your locals. Hopefully we get it out all over the state so we get representation from places like this. And we're also working on, again, as much as we focus on youth, uh, we're also really focusing on uh, older, especially older lesbians, who are the number one folks going into homelessness these days and facing a huge amount of issues. So we're trying to look across the lifespan. And again, we're on the policy areas that we focus on. And local politics matter, right? You got an out ally, out uh, council member that is fantastic, right? You may not agree with every policy any of us has. You don't have to, but you probably don't agree with yourself all the time. If you're serious, um, or certainly your spouse or the people that you live with, right? So find the ways that we are alike. Find the ways that we are that we can come together and continue to make our our community powerful and strong and loving and accepting for all. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Eggman. I also wanted to thank, uh, express my uh, sincere thanks for welcoming us, uh, for coming out tonight to express uh, some of the very specific issues that are on your minds. Um, uh, underscoring what Senator Eggman said, you know, not being a one done, this is exactly why we are taking the time out of a wild schedule that I think is imposed on us, trying to get through uh, all the time points that we have on this calendar to do the work for the people of California is because Reaching to, to be here is important to us. We can't forget anybody in any corner of the state and We want to make sure that this is something that is registered for us as we are working on So many of these inner inner uh, related issues and for a lot of the subjects that were brought here tonight we fully feel um, and, and are recognizing are responding to a lot of the topics a lot of the stress that that you're feeling here today and know that we're going to continue to do that. I, I appreciate that there's, um, you know, whether think about housing issues, homelessness, healthcare. These are things that you know transcend a lot of communities and a lot of uh, parts of geographies here in California. But they're particularly accentuated for our LGBTQ community, and they're particularly heightened here in the Central Valley. And that is something that we 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 need to stop and take a moment here and recognize that to go back to Sacramento and make sure that that's not forgotten. Um, Issues on supporting youth and on the other end of the spectrum, supporting uh, our aging population uh, are something we're fully aware of. Others, uh, our colleagues or are, are, are straight colleagues are fully aware of too, the aging population that we have. And why that of course is particularly a challenge for our community is because not many people have family networks. They don't have kids. They don't have that sort of traditional model to be able to have uh, somebody to be able to support you when, when things might get a little bit more difficult and you need you need that care. So we are thinking about highlighting that in the not just the policy work that we're doing, but also the budget work that we're doing. And we've had some wins, and that really filters down to county and to city and to local community-based organizations. Um, but we haven't always had wins. I heard uh, we heard a lot of issues. Thank you, everybody. But you know, are we doing something on trend, uh, supporting transgender asylees? Actually, yes. Uh, we had a, a big uh, request last year as well, in a, despite a $30 billion deficit, um, to support trans asylees as well as transgender uh, uh, entrepreneurship, um, and a lot of other efforts that unfortunately didn't make the cut with negotiations uh, with, with, with others as well. But we'll keep going back and we'll continue to fight for exactly what we're hearing tonight. Um, underscoring again, running for office, but also thinking about uh, which offices that you're running for. We have heard, um, and we know, they've been very public about it, that more conservative and right-leaning groups are actively taking over school boards. And that's why we're seeing these hateful policies come up. And those are the ones that are under the radar. It's not always easy to know on the ballot because it doesn't say who's a Democrat or who's a Republican. So we have our work cut out for us to try to, we were years behind, Equality California runs a great training institute available to you to be able to get some basic tools about how to do community organizing and how to work, how to run, and how to win. And so I encourage, yes, supervisors or council members, great, uh, great and important offices with a lot of influence, but there's so much down ballot that sometimes goes unopposed because nobody will even challenge those status quo 